Welcome back. Canada's housing market took a bit of a breather after a hot pandemic run. So how is it doing now? Here's a look by the numbers. In Toronto, home prices dropped to 1.1 million in March, down 14.6% from a year ago, although there was a slight uptick from February's level. In Vancouver, prices for all properties hit 1.14 million in March. That's a decline of 9.5% from March 2022. And Calgary saw a huge drop in inventory in the month of March, while the average price was virtually flat at 535,743. Meanwhile, mortgages fell sharply, down 41% in January. That's the weakest start to the year since 2015. And fewer of those mortgages are variable. In January 2022, variable rates were 56.9% of total mortgages. By this January, they were just 16.7%. Recreational real estate is showing new strength. In Alberta, for instance, vacation homes were up 13.3% in price to 1.2 million. Similar jumps were seen across the country a sign perhaps that there is still plenty of strength in real estate. So is the softness in housing behind us? And does that mean affordability may be at hand for some? There seems to be little sign of real affordability, but have we seen the bottom? Nazma Ali is founder and broker of One Group. Nazma, great to have you with us. Thank you, Amanda. So what's your read from the ground? There are some signs here that prices ticked up month over month in some big markets. Do we take that as the sign that the, the worst of the price declines are over? It's hard to say because we have no control over where the rates go from here. Um, but what we are seeing is that since they've announced a pause to rate hikes, um, we've seen demand increase. Uh, so kind of late January, beginning February, we started to see more and more demand. Um, and because inventory is still very low, uh, we're seeing multiple offers in many markets. So let's talk about that inventory and the volume of sales, because the big declines we've seen, even when we haven't seen massive price declines, we did see these huge drops in just the sheer volume of sale out there. Is that just a case of uh, sellers saying, I'm not going to sell into a falling market, I'm going to wait? And should we expect some big tidal wave of houses to come on the market at some point? I mean, for the past year, that's what everybody has kind of been waiting for is this big crash. And like you said, a big tidal wave of a uh, flood of listings. We haven't really seen that yet. I don't know if we will see it in the future. So far, we haven't really seen it. Uh, as you said, the prices have, you know, right now, they're still 14.6% less than they were last year. Uh, so we're, we're still kind of you know, we're starting to increase slowly in price since February. If you look at the uh, the numbers, we, we have increased. February has increased from Jan, and then March has increased from February. Um, investors are, if they're in a, in a good place, they're choosing not to sell right now. They mm -hmm. saw what the prices were last year, and they just kind of have hope that one day prices will get back to that or maybe even higher. And so if they, if they don't need to sell, they're not selling. And they're holding off and they're, and they're kind of withstanding, you know, the rate hikes, because the, the, most of them were on variable. And they just took punch after punch and they just stead, you know, stood firm. And now, I mean, most, most of these investors are paying all interest mm -hmm. on their mortgage monthly. Um, and then I, and on the end user perspective, they're waiting, not necessarily because they're not going to get that high price, because if they're moving, they're also, you know, they're kind of getting a good deal, not really a deal, but you know what I mean? Like yep. they're saving on the purchase, they're losing on the sale. But why a lot of people are not moving, you know, as much as before is just the uncertainty and the fear and, you know, the higher interest rates. A lot of people are still not used to seeing these, you know, five, six percent rates mm -hmm. compared to last year, 1.5. Only about 30 seconds here, Nazma, but is the market healthy in the sense we were seeing uh, at the height of the market deals with no conditions, not healthy, uh, and we hear talk of deals falling through, people not able to actually close their financing even though they want the house. Are we in either of those positions right now? We're not where we used to be last year, which in a way is healthy. Uh, we're seeing buyers much more cautious, much more conservative, also because their budgets and their approvals are a little bit lower because mm -hmm. of the, the higher rates. Um, and I, I, But the only thing is just the inventory is low. That's what's causing the multiple offers. But people should not assume that because there's multiple offers, we're back at pe peak prices of last year. We're very far from those peak prices. We're, we're still pretty, I mean, steady right now. Nazma, always good to get your view. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Nazma Ali is founder and broker of One Group.
There is one group of people that feels particularly hard done by when it comes to housing, and that's young people. Recent research from the McDonald-Laurier Institute showed that 86% of young Canadians think their parents had an easier time buying a home and starting a family than they do. Less than half of Canadians, aged 18 to 29, think they'll have a better standard of living than their parents did. Paul Kershaw is a policy professor at UBC and founder of Generation Squeeze. Great to have you with us, Paul. Thanks for having me. So in part, you, th you think, you know, it's always hard and people kind of minimize things that were hard in the past. It, it would be hard to argue that it's harder to buy a house today to actually get that beginning down payment and get into this market than it has been in the past, even though we have seen prices come down a little bit. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hard work absolutely doesn't pay off today like it used to when thinking about how much time you have to put in to save a down payment for a major cost of living. Let me give you the clear stats. When my mom started out in the housing market in the mid-1970s, it took about five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average-priced home across this country, in BC and Ontario, and even about that amount of time in Metro Vancouver and in the GTA. But if you flash forward to today, the average across Canada is now 17 years, it's about 22 years in BC and Ontario, and more like 27 years in the GTA and Metro Vancouver. And then the consolation prize of being locked out of home ownership for longer periods of one's life is rising rents, which then makes it harder to save by comparison with the past. And of course, one really long-term consequence of this that should concern everybody uh, is the houses are sort of for savings. So the earlier you get into it, the more you have a chance of having an asset later on in your life that you can actually live off of, which is what a lot of people, it becomes kind of forced retirement savings in a way. What happens to all these young people who only get to build the value of that asset for you know, a couple of decades, not four decades. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think actually the, the thinking that it's not just for savings, but that housing could be a wealth windfall, which has really gotten us into this problem. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to think about housing as an investment because I've got a large mortgage and I'm gonna pay it off over time over the next decades. But in regions like BC and Ontario, we've normalized the idea that we also want our home price to rise and rise and rise beyond whatever we pay our mortgage off to be. And I think that's the that's the big risk. We need to break our addiction to that hope that home prices will continue to rise beyond local earnings. It's made me wealthier. I've gained a million bucks in the last four years in my home being in Metro Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, but that is making it so much harder for someone just as smart as me and just as hardworking as me to be able to live where I do. So you're kind of and nailing I, what could be the central problem, Paul, which is that we've stopped thinking about homes as a basic human right and something everybody is entitled to. And we've started thinking about them as a, an investment that pays off in some massive way. How do we reset that so that really Really, your house is savings, keeps pace with inflation. You might make a little bit of money over on top of that, but you shouldn't expect to make a windfall. Exactly right. And so we need our governments to embrace just that idea with the language that housing is for homes first, investment second. The investment second piece gets off pay your mortgage off, but let's not count on housing driving these major wealth windfalls. And we now need those like me who've enjoyed major wealth windfalls to think about what do we now, what can we now contribute to from our wealth windfalls to getting more deeply affordable housing built in the short term to try and take off some of the pressure from a younger demographic and newcomers of of any age who are just being hammered by a broken housing system. Only a few seconds here, but that same younger demographic is going to support an awful lot of old people. How much uh, kind of inequity do you see ahead for this generation? So much inequity. Just as our country has absorbed too much, uh, too much of the atmosphere's scarce capacity absorbed carbon, and we now leave extreme weather as our legacy, we've ex extracted so much wealth from our housing system, we leave little unaffordability left over, and it's that younger demographic who is now being asked to pay large, large increases to old age security and medical care for the aging population when they are financially squeezed. So now we need to ask a an affluent boomer population to think about its housing wealth and how that may be able to contribute to some of the hmm. programs they want in later in their lives. Paul, so good to have you with us. Appreciate your time. Paul Kershaw is a p policy professor at UBC, founder of Generation Squeeze. Still ahead, a group of scientists who know artificial intelligence better than anyone is urging a pause in how it's developed. And that should give us all pause. That's coming up. But first, turns out when your business blows up, it can be a literal affair. At least it was for Virgin Orbit, which is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection after its failed rocket launch in January sent a payload of research and defense satellites plunging into the ocean. Financing dried up after that mishap, leaving Virgin high and dry something that can't be said of its last rocket. We're back after this.